Over the next 20 years, this generation of young adults will come of age and attempt to own property in a time when <clears throat> the cost of living continues to soar, COVID-19 and other diseases like measles continuously threaten to ravage people's immune systems and lung capacities, a brutal rampage by the West's apparent ally in the Middle East threatens to kill millions in a regional war, emaciated and decapitated children's bodies from said rampage are strewn across social media screens, institutions like public libraries, crucial infrastructure like bridges potentially on the verge of collapse, and disaster relief resources go increasingly unfunded, and oh yeah, climate disasters which should be get aforementioned relief are ratcheting up around the world, displacing and killing more and more people. And amidst this societal, geological, and economic collapse, young adults must choose a path at the center of the empire for the next 48 years between two political candidates who genuinely have no plan to make any of that better. The only difference is that one of them wants to make it worse more quickly. And if you say publicly that the other one will also make things worse, a ton of older people will jump you online, flex their degrees at you, scold you, and genuinely insinuate that you are the reason everything is getting worse, and not, you know, all the other stuff. I'm here to say, fuck that shit. Gen Z deserves better than this hell. And none of our political authorities or economic authorities or trusted elders are doing anything close to providing a solution. One party suggests plugging in the holes of the iceberg-stricken Titanic with our fingers. The others suggest that it hasn't been damaged at all, and in fact are looking to kick people off the boat who have pretensions that it might be damaged. In the halls of this vaunted ship which took much time and technology to create, folks scream at each other about the metaphysical underpinnings. Some say we should have never built the ship at all, and that this continuous striving for bigger and cooler ships is causing us to destroy not only the environment we strip to build them, but our own safety via the reckless compromises made in the process. Other people scream back that such ruminations are pointless, that if those people are so smart, why don't they figure out how to save this ship, that dying on this ship is probably the best of all outcomes anyway, and also the ship isn't really in that bad shape, you yeah. know? Oh, also there's a mental health crisis going on, which is probably unrelated. Alright bro, now's the time to figure out your next move. Look around you. Who do you think gets it, and who doesn't? And I don't mean just gets it like watches Brad Sue video essays and engages in Marxist Twitter discourse. I mean gets it. Who fundamentally understands the crisis at play and is trying to save not only themselves but as many other people as they can. Those are your allies. The people who don't want to believe that this shit is untenable are not worth working with right now. In a lot of cases, there's probably nothing you can do for them. And that means there's no reason to keep yelling at a lot of the people that you're yelling at. They don't get it. They won't get it. They refuse to get it. Some of them are worth actively avoiding, but that's up to your discretion. Because at the end of the day, your task is to survive. There is a constantly growing community of people around the world who also wants to survive and realize that they will more easily and happily survive together. Your task is to find them. Here are some things you should maybe be doing over the next hundred years or so, if any of this is resonating with you. This is going to be quick and basic. You can contribute to your community in various ways. Learn how to cook. Learn locations and directions as much as possible. Perhaps learn how to drive, although we should minimize fossil fuel usage where we can. Learn first aid. Learn how to grow simple produce. Check out the substack of The Last Farm for info on sustainable agriculture practices we can utilize in community. Above all, be where you're needed. A common piece of advice you get under capitalism is that you should never do what you're good at for free. And while I get that we have to make money in order to survive, I do think that advice holds us back quite a bit from actually knowing what it takes to survive and thrive in community with others. I would like to posit the contrary. I would say figure out what you are good at and what you like to do, and figure out how, as much as possible, you can contribute that skill set and interest to other people for little to no cost. Again, obviously the way that the world currently works is you have to make money to survive, but think about how more and more, for 5 more minutes each day, 10 more minutes each day, you can contribute more and more out of not just the goodness of your heart, but the real interest in benefiting the people around you. Whatever skills you learn, whether it's basic household skills that are taken for granted or specialties that take long amounts of time to study and hone, your abilities and skills can not only benefit you, but the people around you. 
All right. So in 2020, lawyer and activist Dean Spade published a book called Mutual Aid. It's about mutual aid. Mutual aid is an alternative to charity and dependence on the rich. It's a, a term that describes a huge array of things and ultimately means how we organize to help each other without any single one of us having a huge amount of resources. Spade describes it as collective coordination to meet each other's needs, usually from an awareness that the systems we have in place are not going to meet them. You should read Dean Spade's book. I mean it. That's one of the things I'm telling you to do in this video. It's less than 100 pages of reading. You can get through it in about three days or five tops, I think. In it, he outlines the three key elements of mutual aid that make it different from just sending money around and especially different from charity. One, it's about survival, but also understanding truly what we are surviving. Mutual aid projects work to build survival needs and build shared understanding about why people do not have what they need. Two, it organizes us to actually do something to change the world together. Mutual aid projects mobilize people, expand solidarity, and build movements. Three, it shows us that we can solve or at least mitigate our problems better if we work en masse rather than waiting for a savior. Now we've seen time and again, folks, how relying on and praising wealthy people for being charitable is a bad idea. For one, it allows them to use their philanthropy as a pretense to get away with anything, including lying about their philanthropy. The most recent and pertinent case in our generation is that of Mr. Beast, of course, who built up this impenetrable reputation simply by doing several videos donating to charity and building charitable projects. I get jealous of Canadians because they have universal health care. We just have Mr. Beast. <laughs> he found a thousand blind strangers and gave them free corrective eye surgery because our health care relies on the Willy Wonka system. <laughs> This covered for the fact that in addition to faking a lot of elements of these projects in his videos using editing tricks and lying about how much he spends on them, he has been promoting gambling to children, pump and dumping crypto, hiring sex offenders, and torturing game show contestants, among other things. For legal purposes, I will say this is all alleged, but you should check out Jack Saint's work analyzing this and Rosanna Pansino's work covering more and more developments in this situation. Rather than us go online and praise Mr. Beast and whoever else the next Mr. Beast could be for using their vast amounts of wealth to do nice things, we should use our critical thinking skills. If we're too uncomfortable to ask what these rich people gain from doing these projects, tax breaks and clout, or whether it's effective at all at solving real problems, it isn't, we should at least question people who have amassed large fortunes because History and current events show us time and again that you don't get large fortunes without exploiting and hurting many people. You don't get rich by being nice. And we should analyze how, without relying on some nice billionaire who doesn't exist to save us, we can actually save ourselves. One common example of mutual aid is collecting donations of food to be distributed for free to anyone in the neighborhood, regardless of their income. Food can be distributed then evenly according to a structure that can be agreed upon by the people participating. Cooked using affordable and healthy ingredients instead of bought at a premium from restaurants and delivered by those who can deliver food, either with their feet or with cars, bicycles, to people with disabilities who can't go out and pick it up themselves. This is how the skills you learn can help those around you. You see? Let's see where we're going. Look for a mutual aid network around you. If you can't find one yet, you might wanna attend your local. It's become kind of common to shit on protests for being ineffective. And while I do understand and share skepticism that marching around and yelling at people who won't listen that we should change things could actually change things, I do think that there are valuable aspects of protests that often go overlooked. For one, protests can be healthily cathartic, and that's a good thing. Especially for people who grow up in sheltered, hive-mind-like environments in which nobody seems to care about social justice or the constant death and destruction our governments and wealthy people are causing, it can be a powerful experience to get out in the street and yell the truth with hundreds of other disenchanted people just like you. But probably more importantly, it gives you a place to meet hundreds of other disenchanted people just like you. Now, not every organization that shows up to a protest is worth investing time in. 
I can admit that. But at the very least, it gives you a sense of what kind of mobilization is occurring, what kind of local politics are occurring and how they work. And moreover, you can actually make valuable friends at protests that can help you become a more true version of yourself instead of feeling like you have to shrink yourself and your concerns to meet the vibes of the people around you who continue to kind of ignore these things. And these valuable friends can connect you with valuable mutual aid organizations or help you learn important ideas or skills. Protest basically never gets covered by mainstream media anymore, but it's still valuable in serving as a reminder to a neighborhood that a lot of people there are not comfortable with the state of affairs, are incredibly frustrated with them, and are willing to continuously shout it out and make noise because we can't be complacent about it. This is especially valuable given how complacent people are when it comes to certain political organizations like the supposedly left-leaning Democratic Party in the US. The Democratic candidate for president, Vice President Kamala Harris, has run a campaign which mostly relies on contrasting her with Republican candidate Donald Trump. It is true that Harris proposes some better policies and is not quite as bad of a presidential candidate as Trump. But it seems she and the Democrats have convinced most of her liberal constituents that this gap is of a much larger magnitude than it is, and that this separation is more than enough to satisfy the problems that we are facing. And yet, her policy commitments and ideological commitments suggest the opposite. Kamala Harris wants you to believe, for instance, that she is so different from the Republican Party, but she is also happy to welcome the endorsement of very right-wing Republican figures like Liz Cheney, who she trotted out at a rally with the banner Country Over Party. Country Over Party? Sign me up. I felt the need to make that joke. She has courted over a dozen Republican endorsements in the state of Wisconsin alone, a battleground state. And may I remind you that this is the Republican Party that is still staunchly for tax breaks for the wealthy, more and more difficulties for labor, violent policies against women and immigration, etc., etc. A lot of people might note that these Republicans are not Trump Republicans, and it's important that we make that distinction, and that somehow Kamala Harris happily endorsing people like Liz Cheney and saluting her father Dick Cheney as a valuable servant to the United States despite being one of the most evil and violent vice presidents in the history of the country. I'll just let y'all continue to think that the Republican Party has so many different ideological commitments aside from orange man or not orange man. A lot of people might note though that this is a strategy to win an election. You can't just try to appeal to one side, you have to reach across the aisle, try to take some votes away from the opposition. Now, I think this naively ignores some of the many policy similarities, past and present, that Harris shares with these right-wingers. Obviously, both parties are fiercely supporting Israel and their genocide, with Harris declaring at the Palestinian Free DNC that she wants the US military to have the most lethal fighting force in the world, and supporting President Biden in sending constant shipments of bombs to Israel. We know what they're doing with those bombs, and somehow, her statements regarding the border with Mexico are even more right-wing than expected. She has stated she wishes to further intensify the border crackdown against poor people seeking asylum, and has spread propaganda via Twitter of fentanyl being distributed over the border by migrants, despite hard evidence that most of the fentanyl is being smuggled into the US by US citizens. Merkel. As California Attorney General, she denied gender-affirming care to trans prisoners and refused to reduce overcrowding in prisons by releasing non-violent offenders cleared as having little to no risk of recidivism or threats to public safety. She's even goddamn said that the only difference that she would have from Joe Biden's presidency, which has been widely regarded as a very right-leaning Democratic presidency, is that she'll have a Republican in her cabinet. What else does she need to tell y'all? Nobody cares about these oppressive policies Kamala Harris has espoused and implemented because she's not Donald Trump. And when she becomes president, even though many people now are telling you that it'll be okay to criticize her then, many will still roll their eyes at criticism of her because Trump would be worse. At a certain point though, we have to show that we actually care about the people dying and being harmed by our government. And we can start to do so through protest, something that we still have the right to do in this country. Mostly. There's a lot more to say, including about individual, community, and environmental health, which I'll have to save for future work. 
But I think that last point transitions well into my conclusion, which is about the necessity for critical thinking and education. And a lot of this has to do with my relationship with you. Many content creators have risen to popularity on YouTube and other apps through their emphasis on educating people or offering analysis about current events. This comprises a broad spectrum of people. What I worry about is how much you rely on people like me or other people you perceive to be in my niche or part of the same movement to tell you what's to think so that you don't have to think critically on your own. You can just pop our videos on in the background, feel like you agree with everything we say, and leave it at that. Celebrities and content creators alike, as opposed to the notion that we shouldn't look to them for their opinions on politics and stuff like that, have a responsibility to engage with politics and to build a political education, to speak out about oppression and immorality. And so friends, it's time to talk about Chapel Roan. Yeah, you thought I wasn't gonna talk about it, but here I am. I promise I don't have much to say here, but I do want to highlight a video by content creator D'Angelo Wallace, a creator who I think has put out some good stuff in the past and often does a good job of calling out immoral actions of public figures, but who I really think missed the mark on assessing pop star Chapel Roan's recent controversy regarding her vote and political views. If I had to sum up today's entire video in a single word, it would be miscommunication. In short, Chapel Roan has long stood for trans rights and Palestinian rights, often raising funds for victims of genocide in Palestine and refusing a White House invite due to Biden's policies on Palestine. And so when asked, you know the story, who she would endorse recently, she said that she encourages people to vote federally and locally, but refuses to endorse either presidential candidate. Since then, there has been a whirlwind of misinterpretation and misunderstanding by people who somehow equate her to being a right winger or centrist because she can't see the obvious difference between really bad and really, really bad. Wallace is one of those people, suggesting Chapel Roan should hire a PR team and that she is not understanding there are lives at stake. I hope you don't settle for what we have. Now, I've been cutting out a lot of her statements because they're a little rambly, but I actually think this is the first time at the very end of her final video that she actually finally said, yes, one is obviously better than the other. The quote unquote news and pop culture accounts that are clipping this out of context and spreading it all over the internet are definitely at fault here in my opinion. But at the same time, media training, you know, a little bit of practice with interviews would have alleviated this issue. You're not going to be presented a perfect candidate. But when one of the sides is actually death, like for real, forcing people to give birth is deadly. Withholding gender affirming care from people is deadly. Racism is deadly, etc. This isn't a question, it's not an opinion, I'm not exaggerating. Nuance actually is counterproductive when certain things in life are black and white. I'm sorry, that feels so wrong to me. Are there not lives at stake right now? Have there not been lives at stake under democratic administrations? Or do we not care about the people bombed by drone strikes by Barack Obama? Or the people dying in Palestine right now because of Joe Biden? He goes as far as to suggest that we should compartmentalize our critiques of Democrats and wait to express them after the election. But what I didn't realize is none of this is false, but shouldn't I be compartmentalizing that energy for after the election? But no, no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't wait until a political candidate already gets what they want being elected before we make demands of them. I can't believe you have to say this. If we did that as a rule, Joe Biden would still be the Democratic Party's nominee and not have stepped down off of the strength of many things, including the uncommitted campaign in Michigan. To be fair, it's not like their solution in running Harris is much better at all. But politicians don't listen to us before or after elections at this point. You have to speak up regardless. The necessity of speaking up to power is still extremely important for how it builds community and awareness and solidarity among other people. Why should somebody who is Palestinian wants to work with and trust content creators and celebrities who refuse to speak about how all of their relatives are being killed off, how entire blood lines are being killed off in their home country because the Democrats need to win an election who stood by silently until they felt like it was safe and okay to express their opinions. When will it be safe and okay for Palestinians? Palestinian and Arab American voters have historically voted Democrat, but the party has lost support for arming Israel's war on Gaza. 
Democrats, whether it's Biden or Harris, Democrats failed us big times. They dehumanized us. We are demanding that we are looked at as humans. If the Republicans were in party and Trump was already the president and this genocide was going on, then that would have been the event of the season. And the tens of thousands would have been going there. But the reason they're here is because the Democrats are in power, because Biden is the one who's complicit, and Kamala Harris, and Blinken, all of the top Democrats in this country are responsible. And while I can agree that Chapel Roan might need to do more work in how she expresses her criticisms and ideas, calling the Democrats the left is kind of silly at this point. I don't think it's because she should have just said Trump bad and doesn't realize it. I think it's because folks like D'Angelo Wallace, who might not be as experienced in understanding political critiques from trans people and Muslims of both Democrats and Republicans, can willfully misinterpret her as naive or privileged. Then again, it seems like no matter what Gen Z says, no matter how they say it, people will willfully misinterpret them as being naive and privileged. The Chapel Roan situation is a perfect example of that. Sorry, I like Chapel Roan's music, but I feel like as a celebrity, she's fucking insufferable. I feel like when you think of like the stereotype that people have about Gen Z, it's Chapel Roan. I don't love Friendly Space Ninja's video on the topic either, but I do like the compilations he provides of just the kinds of complaints that people are making about Chapel Roan because she's choosing to use her platform to speak out about people stalking her and about politicians being bad. This demonstrates one thing. Chapel Roan being an imperfect orator and role model means so many have decided to dismiss her political ideas and requests for decency from fans as whining and suggest that she doesn't deserve to be successful. Gen Z, have you heard that one before? Both D'Angelo Wallace and the hosts of this, the Toast Pod that there's one of those clips of in the compilation, suggest that she is not cut out for this line of work. That in speaking up against things that are wrong, she is somehow betraying an inability to do the whole job, which should include keeping your mouth shut about things that are controversial among even the most cynical of audiences. The common suggestion is that she doesn't deserve it because she's not grateful and she doesn't use PR to express her boundaries and political ideas. And while we can clearly see that this is part of a pattern of female pop stars being decimated by a public that loves what they produce but hates their mental health, and whether people are being specifically fair or unfair to chapel with certain critiques, I think this point speaks to a larger situation with younger people right now. If you're Gen Z, as soon as you criticize the way that things are, people tell you you're ungrateful. If you criticize both political candidates for killing hundreds of thousands of innocent people and demand better from our government, people will tell you that you just don't understand how a two-party system works. If you say we should all be paid a living wage, that we should have control over the things we produce as workers, or that we should all be guaranteed health insurance, people will hold you personally responsible for each of the Soviet purges. But on an even deeper level, this isn't really about Gen Z at all, is it? D'Angelo Wallace is just as young as Chapel Roan is, but he is still telling her to fall in line and behave more like older celebrities like Taylor Swift, who endorsed Kamala Harris and coincidentally say nothing about genocide against Palestinians. I want to make sure it's clear that I'm not saying D'Angelo Wallace is anti-Palestinian, but I do think his take on Chapel Roan is ultimately invalidating and reductive of the real and necessary criticisms that people his age have about the Democrats, and of the necessity of voicing those at all times, especially during an election where people are paying more attention to politics than they usually ever will. A majority of the people criticizing Democrats on a lot of these issues are Democrats, are registered Democrats. I'm a registered Democrat. Frankly, this is about people who choose to speak up and more importantly, choose to act up who begin investing in mutual aid instead of praising rich philanthropists, who aim to praise critical thinking instead of public relations. This is about people who know that the current state of affairs is deadly and unsustainable, and people who don't. It's about people who can tell the Titanic is sinking and are trying to get as many people off the boat as possible, versus people who want to plug a few holes and get the ship sailing back smoothly. Gen Z deserves better because every generation deserves better. What specifically Gen Z is representing here is the young generation that refuses to fall away quietly, refuses to fall in line to just make money and stop complaining. 
Gen Z represents the younger generations who have yet to live the rest of their lives in a world that is increasingly getting worse and worse, more and more untenable, and nobody seems to want to do anything about it. It's not enough just to recognize that. We need to stop seeking the approval of old hegemonies. We can sit back and complain and cry in our rooms, or we can go out, online or offline, and find the people who are actually working to help their communities and build solidarity. My question to you then, dear audience, is what will you do? How will you contribute? Let me know what you think in the comments section. What will you do? Also, check out my Patreon. I'm working on two long form videos right now that are going to be much more detailed about some of these things. This video is much more of a rant or whatever, but those videos are taking a lot of work. So supporting my channel through Patreon will help a lot. And guess what? There's bonus content on there. I, I upload exclusive interviews with people like FD Signifier and Ola Sunvia and Noah Samson and Saji Sharma and Dr. Fatsma and Babila. I, I upload a lot of interviews on there. Free stuff for you to enjoy. So check that out and thank you for watching.